Hi, thanks for watching. Today's video is going to cover sections 1.7 and 1.8. We're going to skip a little bit because we want to give you the foundational understanding of how geometry works before we get into the proofs. So you remember Euclid. Well, he didn't really invent a lot of the theorems and the things that we're going to learn about this year, but he organized them. We really have to give the title Father of Geometry to a guy named Thales of Miletus. And what Thales did that was so original was that he recognized that all of these geometric concepts are connected. And so he linked one to the other. And when Euclid came around about 300 years later, his great contribution was that he organized these all these thoughts about geometry together into an order. So Euclid started off with 10 basic principles, five axioms and five postulates. We'll look at those in a minute. And from those 10 basic principles, he worked kind of like in stepping stone fashion to prove 465 more theorems. In other words, from 10 basic ideas, he was able to deduce 465 other truths about geometry. We're not going to look at that many this year. We'll probably be around uh, 100 or 120. But it's amazing the work that these ancient thinkers did. So today we have a PowerPoint for you. I'll try and move through it pretty quickly, but feel free to pause and write down any definitions. Um, and you know, feel free, if there's anything you don't understand, to bring it to class and put it up on the Padlet tomorrow. Okay, thanks for watching. Okay, the deductive structure is based on, first of all, Euclid's five axioms. These five axioms are so self-evident that he felt they didn't need to be true, didn't need to be proven. So, for instance, things which are equal to the same thing are equal to each other, or if equals are added to equals, the wholes are equal. These were his five axioms, and no one's really contested them. He also had five postulates. Now, a postulate is our first definition. It is an unproven assumption. So a postulate is an unproven assumption. So we're not going to bother um, proving any of these following five statements. And most of them really don't seem like they need to be proven. For instance, a straight line can be drawn from any point to any point. That almost seems like an axiom. But you could have five of these, the most notable being the fifth. You can see that the first four look very self-evident. Then the fifth postulate, or what's called P5 in mathematics, is a much more complicated statement that we'll look at in depth when we get to chapter 5. So from these five postulates, which you don't need to have memorized for the quiz or anything like that, but from these five postulates, Euclid deduced all 465 theorems in the um, books of the elements of geometry. So what's important to understand is that all conclusions so all theorems are based on things we've already proven, or based upon the axioms and postulates. There are four basic types of statements. Undefined terms, which are similar to axioms. They're, they're just things that are so self-evident they don't require a definition. Postulates and axioms, which we've just mentioned. We'll also come across definitions in our book this year, and theorems. So let's take a look at each of these four. But first, all of the statements are going to be in conditional form. That is a statement such as if then. So for instance, um, if today is Sunday, then tomorrow is Monday. That's conditional form. The if part is called the hypothesis and is abbreviated typically with the letter P. Just like in algebra you use X and in geometry they use triangle ABC. In symbolic logic, the hypothesis is typically represented with a P. The then part is the conclusion, and it's abbreviated by the letter Q. In the class this year, those are two pretty important terms that will come up from time to time. So hypothesis and conclusion. So the statement's original form is abbreviated P arrow Q but we say P implies Q, or sometimes you'll say, if P, then Q. Now an important term for this next section 
and for the rest of the semester is this idea of a converse. The statement's converse is when you flip the hypothesis and the conclusion. So Q implies P. The, the converse often looks and sounds as though it's true, but it's not, and we'll explore that a little bit later. Undefined terms. Well, we don't need to spend a lot of time here. They're just things that are so basic, Euclid and our authors don't feel there's a need to define them. For instance, a point and a line. Definitions. Now these become a little more important. Terms which are more complex, we give a definition to. Something like segment or midpoint or angle bisector. They are always presented in conditional form. So you might say, if a point divides a segment into two congruent parts, then it is a midpoint. Or, if a ray is an angle bisector, then it divides an angle into two congruent parts. We'll learn these definitions later, but I just want you to be aware of the structure and the format that these are presented in this book. What's most important for us about definitions is that they're reversible. That means that as I try to create a chain of reasoning, I can switch around the, con the hypothesis with its conclusion, and it's still true. So let's take a look at an example. If an angle measures 90 degrees, then it is a right angle. That's absolutely a definition. Now if we reverse it, we can say if an angle is a right angle, then it measures 90 degrees. So we took what had been the conclusion, if an angle is a right angle, and we make it the hypothesis. And what had been the hypothesis becomes our conclusion. Either way, that's the definition of a right angle, and it's true. You'll see that as we work into proofs in section 1.4 when we come back, you'll understand how definitions can help link together our chain of reasoning. It all depends on the proof. Sometimes the first version of the definition might be necessary, and in other proofs, the second version will be useful. Okay, postulates, once again, are unproven assumptions, such as two points determine a line, or a segment is congruent to itself. Now, Theorems are what we're going to spend most of the year looking at. They are mathematical statements that can be proven. And these are the 465 statements that, that Euclid proved that made up his elements of geometry. They are always stated in conditional form, with the exception of one or two that will come across um, throughout the year. But the, it's important to remember that they're not always reversible. So you can't use the converse sometimes. Let's take a look at an example. The first theorem, which we haven't learned yet, is a good example. If two angles are right angles, then they are congruent. Well, that's almost self-evidently true. But let's take a look at its converse. If two angles are congruent, then they are right. Now, I know that's not always true because I could have two 45 degree angles that were both congruent but they would not be right angles. So it's important with theorems to recognize the converse is not always true. All right, now there's an idea of negation, and that's when you um, say something is not true. So it has the opposite truth value. So one statement could be, if today is Sunday, and or it is raining, and the negation is, it is not raining. The symbol for it is a little tilde, and we uh, indicate it with symbolic logic. The negation is just the tilde in front of the statement. So the negation of P is just not P. Okay, so we have the original statement is P implies Q. The converse is just flips the original statement hypothesis and conclusion. Q implies P. The inverse negates both of them but doesn't change the order. So not P implies not Q. And finally, the contrapositive 
is the two statements flipped and negated. Okay, a useful theorem for us in our proofs will be theorem 3. It states if a conditional statement is true, then its contrapositive is also true. Let's take a look at an example. Suppose our conditional statement was, if it is raining, then the grass will get wet. Pretty true. And we could abbreviate it as R implies W. Raining implies wet. The contrapositive is formed by flipping the order of the hypothesis and the conclusion and negating both. So the contrapositive would read, if the grass did not get wet, then it is not raining. And that's also true. This is useful because as we try to create a chain of reasoning in our proofs, we're sometimes going to want to use one form of a statement, and sometimes we'll use its contrapositive. So let's see what this chain of reasoning is. As you recall, Euclid started out with 10, ac or 10 basic principles, the axioms and postulates. And we could represent one of those axioms or postulates as F. And from that, he would prove another statement, W. That arrow kind of represents the proof we'll have to do. Well, then if we start another statement with W and prove a conclusion, like, for example, not R, and then start another statement with not R, we begin to form this chain that is linked by the conclusion of one statement becoming the hypothesis of the next, so that we get down to the end and we have a little shortcut that if we know F is true, we can assume, or it implies, that M is true. And that essentially is the proof and what the course is going to be about. Let's take a look at a, a modern example that you might enjoy. When you have cable and your picture freezes, you get irritable. When you get irritable, your work suffers. When your work suffers, the wrong man is convicted. When the wrong man is convicted, he has time to think. When he has time to think, he thinks about you a lot. And when he thinks about you a lot, your house explodes. Don't have your house explode. Get rid of So, the premise was, don't let yourself get bothered by the cable TV uh, freezing. And then the conclusion, after all those steps, was to get, ri uh, get rid of cable. That's kind of like how the theorems work. Um, if we just uh, jump from the beginning, don't let your cable freeze to the end, get rid of cable, that would be the example of a theorem. Okay, um, one last word. There really is no way to do well in this class without memorizing, and that might be something that's very new to you in a math class. But um, this course is not made up of just algebraic manipulation. There's a lot of definitions and theorems which have to be memorized. So thanks for watching. We'll talk more about that later, and I hope this video helps.